Hi, everyone, and welcome to this encore episode of the Global Missions Podcast. We have recently wrapped up the seventh season of the show, and throughout these summer months, we will be representing some episodes from previous seasons. That's exactly right, Maddie. Our production team will get a little bit of a break before really engaging with the work to bring new episodes to life. This will all begin in September. And if you, our listening audience, would help us with this, we've got three quick ways that you can participate in the process with us. First of all, and probably most importantly, we invite you to complete our 2022 listener survey, which is linked in the show notes of this episode. Number two is, and you can do this at any point, leave us a message using the contact form on our website or by emailing our team at info at globalmissionspodcast.com. Your input and suggestions are welcomed. And thirdly, and finally, if you enjoy this program, please leave us a review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you find your podcasts. We do value your feedback greatly. So thank you for taking advantage of these opportunities to share with us in planning for season eight. Well, let's get into today's Encore episode. Welcome to the Global Missions Podcast, a show for Christ followers who want to participate more effectively in God's work, both at home and to the ends of the earth. Visit us at globalmissionspodcast.com to find show notes, resources, and previous episodes. And now, here's your host, Rob Magwood, better known to many friends as Mags. Hello, everyone. Today, we'll be speaking with a very influential figure in the business as mission movement, Matt's has a wealth of experience and understanding about how God is calling and using businessmen and women to intentionally make a tremendous kingdom impact. It actually took quite a while for us to find the right time to talk with Matt's because of his busy travel schedule, but it was well worth the wait. Just as a note as we get going here, because of the amount of material, we decided that this interview would be a bit longer than our typical interview, but we trust you'll find it to be both enlightening and also accessible and practical for your church. Our guest today is Matt's Tunahog, who is a speaker writer and consultant from Sweden who focuses on developing business as mission and strategic business as mission alliances. Mats, along with others, has developed multiple global business as mission think tanks and serves as the chairman of BAM Global, BAM Business as Mission. He has served for many years as a senior leader, both in the Luzon movement and the World Evangelical Alliance. He's a lecturer, he's an author, and we're so glad he'll be sharing some of his experience with us today. Mats, welcome to the program. Thank you very much. Now, we can hear from your bio that you've got a lot of experience working in BAM. Just before we have you share some of that, though, I'd like to, for the benefit of all our listeners, just define business as mission. Uh, It might be an unfamiliar term. When we talk about business as mission today or BAM, what do we mean? When we talk about BAM, we're actually referring to three things. BAM, the concept, BAM, the practice, and BAM, a global movement. The concept, briefly, it is to shape and reshape your business for God and for people, aiming at having a positive impact on multiple bottom lines for multiple stakeholders. And so that concept is something we've looked at and tried to develop over the years, and we'll get back to that. And of course, then businesses around the globe, small, medium, large, different industries, different countries have then tried to take these principles, these concepts, shaping your business so it serves God, serves people. So that has become a practice. And now, thirdly, this is also a global movement Today, we can talk about thousands and thousands of businesses, especially in the small and medium-sized sector that are practicing this, but also the three other major constituencies in the movement, which are churches, denominations, mission agencies, NGOs, nonprofits, and also academic institutions, universities, business schools, seminaries. So BAM is a concept, it's a practice, and a movement. Mm -hmm. We'll come back and unpack some of that a little bit more here, but that gives us a basic framework to think about this morning. It's morning in Canada, it's afternoon in Sweden as we record this. 
Mats, let's just go back a little bit, though, and just give us a few highlights from your participation in BAM over the years. A large part of my journey into the business transmission movement happened in Soviet Union and then the former Soviet Union in the Stans, in the Central Asia republics, the Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, Kazakhstan. When the Soviet Union imploded in December ninety one. There was a number of things that changed. One country became 15 countries. One command planned economy became 15 national economies that had to adjust to global market realities. You went from a Soviet communist system where everybody had a job, and not necessarily meaningful or productive, to a phase where unemployment and underemployment quickly rose from 0% to 30, 50, and 70%. And with that, of course, came all kinds of problems, social ills, labor migration, labor exploitation, human trafficking, all the things that happens when there's kind of an economic collapse. So I was just looking at how, what do we do here? How can we respond to this? So I spent a few years, a couple of years talking to uh, Christian businessmen and women and associations around the globe, what would it take for you to come with me to Central Asia? And then in the, this is in the mid nineties. And then we started the Central Asia business as mission consultation, which we ran for about 10 years. And we learned quite a bit through that. And then I got invited to other countries in the Middle East and Africa. Could you do something similar for us? And then I thought, well, there's something brewing here. There's something emerging Maybe we should have a global think tank. Maybe we should try to produce a global white paper on business as mission. So 2002, I initiated that. And a result of that was the Lausanne paper on business as mission and the business as mission manifesto. It catalyzed a lot of action working with business people, especially, but also leaders in church and mission and academia. And it started to be embraced by different groups on every continent. Um, it sort of gradually grew. In 2011, we started a, a second, much bigger global think tank, which involved 35 national and regional working groups looking at BAM from different perspectives, both theological and strategic, geographical and industry-based and issue-based. So it has grown from, from there, and it has become a global movement, which in BAM Global, which I'm the chairman of, our mission is to equip, strengthen, invigorate the global BAM movement. And we do that by sharing ideas and connecting people, if we put that that briefly. Sure. Equip, strengthen, and invigorate. It's a good little triad there. This history helps us understand, too, that this is not something that is really new. Of course, if we look back even biblical times, there's examples of business's mission. This has been developing over time, and yet it does seem like a newer concept still to in many churches. Is that your observation? Is that how it feels? Or is this well-accepted, well-known? Yes and no. I mean, as you point out, it is not new. We're not claiming that we are original. God is the original entrepreneur. <laughs> he created everything. And at the end of each production day, he did a quality control and said, these products are, are good. And we've always seen people throughout history who've been trying to serve God and people as they do business. So what we are experiencing in the last 25 years or so is a reawakening among business people for this God-given concept and calling. Now, when we started to talk about these things and do these things in the 90s, people were resistant and rejected it. Some were hesitant and some were cautious. I had one pastor who even told me, Christians don't do pornography, Christians don't do business. That was the same kind of category. <laughs> so, if I go back 15, 20 years, there were a lot of hesitation. People were thinking, is this some kind of prosperity theology? What is this thing? But now you can, wherever I go, and I, I travel about 200 plus days per year internationally, 
you come to any country on any continent and people are familiar with business as mission. So they, we've seen an exponential growth of the understanding of the concept, but also the application of the concept. I wonder whether we see some here alignment with something else we wrestle with, and that's the secular and sacred divide. And I don't mean that they're exactly related here, but there's maybe some parallel in the reluctance of the church or the understanding of the church. And what is secular is separate than what is sacred. Perhaps we're doing a better job of integrating those in these days, and hopefully that's positive for the BAM movement as well. It's a good observation because that, that's the sort of the biggest mental paradigm shift we have to work through, even in, in the BAM movement, the sacred secular divide. You know, what is theology of work? What is theology of business? What is theology of profit? Business as mission is taking our Sunday talk into a Monday walk. We're thinking through, we're not just in business, but we are working on our business. So we're taking the principles and the professions we make in church on Sunday about justice, about great commission, about love your neighbor and creation care. We're taking these biblical narratives and principles, the Sunday talk, into a Monday walk when we shape and reshape our businesses for God and for people. And that is bridging definitely or breaking down that secular divide. Very good. Well, earlier on, you mentioned these three ideas as we define and get familiar with this idea of business as mission, a concept first. Just unpack that a little bit more for us. When you say that business as mission is a concept, what do you mean? Based on what the, the Bible teaches us and what the church has understood and been practicing uh, for the last 2,000 years, years. We're trying to understand what it means in our time. And the concept is based on three mandates, among other things, three biblical mandates. Number one, the creation mandate or the cultural mandate, that we are created to be creative, to create good things for ourselves and for others. And in business, of course, we are created to be creative in business to create good products and services, which could be a blessing for many stakeholders and glorifying to God. So it's that whole, that's the creativity or cultural mandate. The second mandate is the Great Commission mandate. Love God, love your neighbor. When we do business, we have this dual perspective. We do it for God and for people. And then we ask, so in business, who is my neighbor? If I'm going to love my neighbor, who is my neighbor in business? Well, it is, of course, the customers and clients, the staff, the suppliers, the competitors, the river that runs through town, the church, the tax authorities, the city, the nation. It is this kind of constant thinking and reviewing and, and applying then. How do I love my neighbors. Well, what does it mean as I take care of my customers? I do product development, the way I treat my suppliers, the, how I file my taxes. So that's the second mandate. The third mandate is the Great Commission mandate. And that is making sure that we have a global outlook, that we're part of a global thrust. So business as mission has this emphasis on to all peoples. So if God has called us to business, where shall we do it? Well, Jerusalem, fine. But we want to really push and stress the Judea, the Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. So if we take these three mandates, that, that's sort of one basis, not the whole basis, but one basis for the BAM concept. The creation cultural mandate, the great commandment mandate, and the great commission mandate gives us a good sense of this. Now, you went from concept to practice. When you think practice, how do you define this? The businesses then try to look at, so what does it mean in real life? It's easy to say hallelujah, but how do you do it? <laughs> it's easy to say business as mission, but what does it mean? And this is also why we have created these different groups around the globe where people can look at what does this mean if we're trying to 
use business to fight human trafficking. How do we do it then? We have another group. People have been looking at, well, if you're going to go to the ends of the earth and among all peoples, uh, into the Muslim world, Hindu world, Buddhist world, and so forth, what does it mean to shape business for God and for people in these contexts? There's about 100 or so businesses around the globe that ban businesses that are focusing on coffee, the whole chain from the coffee plant to the coffee cup. They are reviewing what does that mean from the farming of coffee to the wholesale, to retail, to roasting, to coffee shops and so forth. So it's And it's different also if you do it in a small size business or a large size business. It has all kinds of applications in terms of also money and investment. What do we mean by return on investment? It is taking the concept that we have in a constant conversation about and then trying to see how we can apply that in various countries, various industries, and in various businesses. So that's the practice. Mm. Do you start to get resistance or do you see resistance points when you talk about ROI, return on investment, things like that in the Christian community or, or is there a broad acceptance really? It's not a resistance, but it is, you know, we have a, in the church, a 2000 year emphasis on wealth sharing which is good. <laughs> Nothing wrong with that. <laughs> that we are to, to share, we are to give, we are to give to the poor, share with others. Generosity is all good. But there's never any wealth to be shared unless it has been created. So Business as Mission is, is looking at the creation of wealth. And by wealth, we don't just mean financial wealth. How do we create social wealth, spiritual wealth, intellectual wealth? and different kinds of wealth. You can be financially rich, but socially poor. You can be rich, but have no friends. And what we want to create different kinds of wealth for different kinds of stakeholders. And part of that is then, of course, we also need money to invest, to grow businesses. But then we need to review because we're so used to thinking that ROI and investment is is one product in a two-way street. The product is money, and the two-way street is I put some money into a business or to Wall Street, and hopefully I get more money back as quickly as possible. Now, that's not wrong, but it's a limited understanding from a biblical perspective. And as we also are understanding it in the BAM movement, we want to put in different kinds of capital, more than one product. We want to put in, of course, financial capital to grow a business, but also social capital, intellectual capital, the mentors and coaches, but spiritual capital, pray for businesses, pray for customers, pray for staff. But not all investments may come back to the original investor. We're thinking not just a two-way street, we're thinking more like a, a roundabout which has many entry points and many exit points. What if I put in $10,000 to business? I don't get a financial return in terms of an interest, but I get my principal back. But the return on investment is also shown in people getting jobs. The communities are flourishing. That's return on investment that goes to other stakeholders. We can rejoice in that. And I think we need to be more creative when we think return on investment. And these are some of the conversations and practice we have in in the BAM movement. Implied in all of this, Matt, is that business's mission has become a movement. And you've mentioned that maybe in some of your bio as well, even just your, you've got several decades now in this, the former Soviet Union into Central Asia and beyond. Just tell us, what is the status of the movement in these days? 2020? How's it going? First, let's briefly just define what we mean by a movement. I mean, we had the um, abolition movement, William Wilberforce, fighting against slavery and slave trade. We had the civil rights movement in the U.S. We had charismatic movement, to speak about the sort of a Christian movement. These are movements that are beyond any person's control. A movement can have a few figurehead, but it's not one organization. It's a concept that is embraced by different groups and the practices, and it sort of spreads like wildfire. <laughs> the same with the BAM movement. It has become 
so many initiatives around the globe that nobody is controlling, but we have sort of the same vision, mission, and values, and we are often relationally based. And in this movement, there are increasing number of universities and business schools that have embraced it. There are a dozen PhDs on it. There are a lot more master thesis on business as mission. There are basically all of the oldest and biggest mission agencies in the world among Protestants have embraced business as mission, which was not the case 20 years ago. We see also an increasing number of local churches, denominations that are embracing it. We see an increasing number of incubators and accelerators that are BAM related. It's not sort of a Western thing. Some of the biggest movements are in Korea and Indonesia. And of course, they speak Korean and and Bahasa. Just to mention the Korean BAM movement, they've been meeting every year now for 14 years. And they gather most of the lot of significant Christian business people, but also some of the biggest churches and mission agencies, and also some academics. Every year, they have a statement. And in recent years, they publish a book on business as mission every year (laughs) from a Korean perspective in Korea. There's a BAM Russia thing. There's a website in Russian. There's a YouTube channel in Russian with BAM videos. There is a Chinese one. There's a Portuguese one. It is a, a global movement, and this is just popping up. It is a is a movement where God is the conductor, for sure. Right, right. Wow, that is so helpful, too. Most of our listeners will be in North America, not all, but sometimes we think we're figuring something out, and it's very healthy and refreshing even to realize that there are elements of this particular movement and others where the Lord is powerfully at work in other parts of the world, and I appreciate you mentioning Russia and South Korea, just as examples of that. The Lord is at work and he is the conductor. Well spoken. I'd like to turn toward what this means for a local church. Many of our listeners are part of a local church. They may be on a missions committee, some pastors, others interested in missions. I'd like to bring this idea of business's mission closer to the church. What are some of the ways that local churches can be involved in BAM? It's a good question, and some are, and just to give a a backdrop to it, we have Assemblies of God in in the U.S., which have 6,000 workers around the globe. They have a business as mission center at the denominational headquarters, for example. So they they want to, as a denomination, make sure that integrated. We have the Four Square Church, which is a global church family in 135-something countries, and all the 18 regions have decided this is going to be part of our church and mission thrust. We have another church denomination in Singapore that have BAM as, as a part of their mission strategy. So it's being embraced. This is part of the movement. But practically, what can a church do? Let me give a few examples. One is from a Baptist church in in Singapore, where I've been speaking, and we talked about a few things, what we can do. And the pastor decided, the senior pastor, that on Mondays, he would visit some businesses that were owned and run by members. So he invited me to come along, and we just walked around the various businesses, learned about their businesses, met some of the staff, looked at the products or the services or the warehouse or the office, whatever it was, and just walked around, asked questions and listened to the joys and the problems that they had in the business. And then we ended up in the office at the end. And, and of course, we had all the prayer points because we've heard <laughs> about the business and we just ended with prayer. And this is really connected the business people with, with the pastor. The pastor cares about what I am doing. And they are the salt and lights in the marketplace. So that's a very practical thing that a church can do. Another thing is encouraging pastors to hold a serious sermons on theology of work, theology of business. I've asked across the globe for the last 20 plus years in different Christian contexts, how many of you have ever heard a sermon on the theology of work? And it's usually zero to five (laughs) percent as you brought up you know the sacred secular divide that needs to be dealt with talked about and so forth and then what can be done too we have often in 
many churches, we have commission services for missionaries as they go to another country. We can also have commission services for different professional groups where we commission and bless business people to be salt and light in the marketplace. Mm -hmm. I have thought along this line, Mats, and it's true because I work in global missions. We do encourage commissioning services for those who are being sent out. And they're usually going in the Acts 1-8 model. They're going to the ends of the earth very often. But I've thought through this idea. Could we have a commissioning service for those who this week are going to go into offices or schools or factories or whatever it may be to lift that and to continue to break down that secular sacred divide? It's a great idea, I think. And I've encouraged pastors, which is quite easy to do, because I've also asked around the globe, I've asked business people, how many of you have ever been asked by your pastor, how can I pray for you and your business? That's usually 0%. Then I asked the same group of business people, every continent, how many of you have ever been approached by a pastor and pastor have asked you for money for the church or for a project? And then it's 95 plus percent. The second question is not wrong, but the, it's sad that there are so few that have ever been asked, how can I pray for you in your business? So I usually just suggest to pastor, here's one way you can get engaged in BAM in your local church. You don't have to hire anyone. You don't have to have an extra line item in your budget. Just ask to meet with some of your business people. And first thing you're going to say, I'd like to meet with you. And I promise you, I'm not going to ask for money. <laughs> just have a small group, five, ten of your business people. And, and just say, I'm just going to ask you one question. How can I pray for you and your business this week? And tell the pastor, you don't have to be come up with answers, anything. Just ask that question and then pray. And some have picked that up, and that has, has made a difference. And that's one way sort of churches, or some of the ways that churches can actually be engaged in business as mission. In a moment, Mats is going to suggest some ways that churches can be supportive of business as mission initiatives during the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic. He'll recommend some practical resources and also provide a few cautions for churches as well. You'll want to stay tuned. Before we get to that part of the conversation, here is a mission resource that we hope will be helpful to you and your church. Ignite your passion for the world. The Jaffrey Center is made up of people like you and me who want to engage the world around them in new and meaningful ways. Through collaborative project development, training, and research projects, the Jaffrey Center seeks to rekindle and ignite a passion for God's unending concern for people. To learn more about us, visit jaffreyglobal.com. And now, back to today's conversation. Okay, we are back with Mats Tunahog. Mats, as we record this episode, we're early in April of 2020, and the world is experiencing the COVID-19 pandemic. There's a lot of concern at the moment, different fields. We can talk about that in a minute, too. I'd like to turn toward that a little bit and say... I guess it would be fair to say that business as mission initiatives would be affected much as because they're integrated into the economy, into the healthcare systems, into hospitality systems. They are affected as all businesses are affected. They would not be immune to the problems. What are some of the things that churches can or should consider in supporting BAM initiatives in this crisis? I wrote a blog recently which is entitled The Coronavirus Pandemic and, and BAM, Seven Things We Can Do. What can we do? How can we bring hope? Recognizing that God is a God of hope and we should be people of hope. Seven things that we can do. And of course, one, pray. We can pray for BAMers and BAM businesses. We can pray for creative thinking and innovative solutions. Ask friends in business how you can pray for them. Start an online prayer group for, for BAMers and businesses. Two, buy. Well, support local businesses by buying their products. Shop online. Do Christmas shopping now. Buy gifts and give to neighbors, family, and people in, in need. Three, give. We can give loans, maybe donations to some of these BAM businesses, Advice if you're if you're an experienced business person, maybe you can come alongside, coach, mentor through these tough times. 
Number four, which is often far away from, from us here in Sweden and from you in Canada, is the the implications for the poor. In We hear in, in the richer part of the world that work out of home, wash your hands, do social distancing. That's an impossibility for hundreds of millions of people. Many people in India, Sub-Saharan Africa, Southeast Asia, in Latin America, they work in the informal sector. They're day laborers. When they're locked down, they lose their income day one. They have no food day two. And there's no social distancing when you're 10 people to a room or if your little shack is part of a major slum like Kibera in Nairobi, Kenya, which is 500,000 people. There's no social distancing and there's no running water where you can wash your hands. So the, the implications of, of this for for the poor is, is huge. So look at other ways, other groups and mission organizations, uh, nonprofits are actually trying to help work with them and, and be generous and give. And then learn what can we learn this is not the first time in the history of of mankind we're going through major disruptions and for those of us who are privileged enough to be able to be home work out of home maybe have some extra time do some readings and i suggest some some books which can be encouraging and one is about the central african country of rwanda who had the genocide in 94 where everything went to ground zero, infrastructure, the social fabric, one million people killed in three months. And now, 26 years later, it's a beacon of hope and one of the better functioning countries in sub-Saharan Africa. Countries can change. This is not the end of all. And we need those kinds of reminders. And I have two more. We're not coming back to just the same thing we need to maybe think about regroup and lastly don't give up it is still a manual god is with us and there are good biblical and other examples of why we need to continue to give hope because there's there's a god who gives us hope Well, persevering uh, in these challenging times and what does it look like to be faithful in these days? We will include a link to Matt's blog post at globalmissionspodcast.com. Matt, you've mentioned before that churches can participate in BAM conferences. This is going to be an interesting season for that because we're very limited in traveling, at least right at the moment with the crisis ongoing. But I wonder if you'd just speak to conferences a little bit and maybe how that's changing what ideas might be in place while we're not able to travel to personally attend a conference. Right now, of course, we were planning to have a a BAM Global Congress in April 2020. And of course, that has been postponed to April 2021. And there are other BAM conferences in different parts of the globe that has either been cancelled or postponed. So an easy way to try to follow BAM conferences around the globe is to go to businessasmission.com, businessasmission.com. Among other things, it's the biggest online resource directory in the world when it comes to BAM. And there we also try to publish about different BAM conferences in different countries in North America there is, will that happen or not? But there's one BAM USA conference planned for Chicago later this fall. There's another called the uh, Faith Driven Entrepreneurs, which is in Dallas in, in September. So there are more. And the US has quite a few. But as it is right now, especially, you know, if people are, some of your listeners are involved in missions, there are in different parts of the world. Yes, there, there are BAM conferences in. Singapore, in Korea, in, in Brazil, in Kenya, in Russia, in Europe, in the Netherlands. There are all kinds. And check businessmission.com. And to make sure you don't have to just log on every now and then, you can actually then sign up for our bi weekly newsletter called the BAM Review. And it doesn't cost you anything, but that will give you 
insightful articles and essays and case studies on BAM, but also give you a list of upcoming BAM conferences around the world. Well, that's a good source of resources at businessasmission.com. I wonder, as we come to the idea of resources, Matts, what other resources do you have to recommend to our listeners and particularly to churches involved in BAM? There's also bamglobal.org, bamglobal.org. I mentioned, you know, we've done a number of think tank groups across the globe in the last 18 years. Uh, So we have involved over 500 people from about 50 different nations in these kinds of conversations. And this is also why it is a global conversation. It's not a Western conversation looking at these issues. And so we have produced about 30 different reports. So this is a gold mine to dig into in terms of both what is the BAM concept, what is the BAM practice, and what is the BAM movement. It sounds like an entire library really there for someone or a church who wants to dig into this and understand more about it. There's uh, at least good footings could be found there in that material. We're part of a a global church and BAM is part of a it's a global movement. So you get insights from, from different parts of the world. And speaking about global, I have a, a website, uh, matstunahag.com. Uh, it doesn't sound very original in terms of name, but it's easy to remember, maybe. <laughs> so my material is in, uh, in 19 different languages. I'll expand just on that idea. If you're listening from a church and you have workers who may be BAM workers or classical missionary workers in different places, knowing that those materials are available in different languages might be another avenue of informing and even inspiring, or as the term was used earlier, invigorating these ideas. This is where I'll also mention just another couple of episodes on the podcast way back in the beginning. Episode number three was with Larry Sharp, who is, of course, acquainted with Matt's. He's someone that you'll know well, Matt's probably. Understanding the basics of business as mission. And then episode 36 with uh, Peter Schaukat. Also, how can the North American church engage in BAM? So if you're in North America, that might be another episode of interest to you. Matt's, as we wind down, I wonder if you would take a turn here with us, and I'd like to talk about cautions that you have for a church that's interested in learning more about BAM or maybe getting engaged with BAM. What cautions do you have to offer them? The two extremes, and to to quote Riot Kipling, is this East and West and West West and never the twain shall meet. That's one extreme. The church is church and business is business and never the twain shall meet. That's one extreme where you totally disconnect and you reinforce force the sacred secular divide we do want to connect the dots we want to take our sunday walk into a monday walk in business we want to affirm business people in our church in their calling we want to equip them so they can serve god and people in and through business and we want to deploy them to service into the marketplace having said that the other extreme which we need to (laughs) avoid is that the church should run businesses, that churches should sort of control business people or, or businesses. They should engage in the right way via the business people that, that exist. I'm not saying that, that there's impossible for a church to be involved in, in business. A church can have a coffee shop, a church can sell some products or services that's, that's possible. But in, in general, just be mindful of what is the role of a church, what is the role of a business. It may not be an issue in Canada and in Sweden, but uh, I, I know, especially in come across that in Africa, for example, in some of the poorer countries, when pastors also start businesses and they start to employ people, and usually church members, and it becomes sort of a fight. Of course, many are unemployed and many are poor. Who's going to get the, the perk of being employed in the pastor's business? But then The pastor also gets kind of a conflicting role. He, on the one hand, should be a shepherd. (laughs) And on the other hand, he's now the boss. (laughs) Uh, And it's a tricky thing. And I've come across a number of times where when those things happen, they actually split the church. And so that's not advisable. And of course, then it's just the whole, the legal issues. 
in most countries, the you know a church and a business are different legal entities, a non-profit versus a for-profit. And then you have different modus operandi. You have different skill sets that are needed. So just have some kind of demarcation lines. What what are we to church to do? And as you say, which is an important question, what should we not do? Well, that's helpful. Some cautions and some points there. Mats, we've managed to stir the pot a little bit and touch on some high points. If our listeners would like to contact you, how can they do that? You mentioned your own website and blog there. How could they reach out to follow up with you? They can go to my website. Uh, my contact details are there. And of course, I'm also linked to bamglobal.org and businessasmission.com. And uh, I'm also linked with uh, transformationalsme.org, which is a BAM investment group that uh, helps small and medium-sized businesses in the Arab world and Asia. So you you find me on directly or indirectly on the, these websites, but on matstunhog.com, you'll find my contact details. Sure. Thank you. We will include all of those links in the show notes at globalmissionspodcast.com. Matt's my last question is just for you to consider the opportunity to speak to pastors and missions committees. If we could gather them all together in a room, and these are the influencers of local churches across North America generally, what would you want to say to that group? We are the body of Christ and not the pyramid of Christ. We tend to often think and act as there is a pyramid of Christ. And at the top of that pyramid, there are the people we often refer to as full-time ministry people, missionaries and pastors. Further down the pyramid, we have people who work in Christian organizations. And then further down the pyramid, we have people carrying professions like doctors and nurses and, and teachers. And then at the base of the pyramid, we have all the rest of us who work in quote unquote, secular professions. And then under the pyramid, they're not even allowed to be on the pyramid, are the business people because they they deal with mammon. (laughs) But we're, we're willing to grant absolution to forgive those business people if they give a lot of money to the people on the top of the pyramid so they can save the world. I've literally have shown that pyramid on a PowerPoint slide across the globe. And I've asked people, have you ever seen this before? And they say, no. Have you ever heard a sermon on the Pyramid of Christ? And they say, no. Do you recognize the Pyramid of Christ? And 90 plus percent say, yes, we recognize the Pyramid of Christ. So it's a mental paradigm shift that is actually there. There's an image we have in our minds which affects our practices that we tend to think it's holier to be a pastor and a missionary than to be a business person or a janitor or a housewife. We really need to tear down that pyramid and come back to a body of Christ function. So if God has called you to business, that is your highest calling. And if you don't like exercise, that's good because there is no pyramid to climb. (laughs) Relax. (laughs) Whatever God has called you to, that is your highest calling. But then we need, as pastors, be reminded of that that we exist to equip the saints to service. So how do we equip? How do we invigorate? How do we strengthen the business people so they can serve God and people in and through business? Well, very good word and uh, some good advice and some stirring comments there. Mats, I want to say a big thank you on behalf of our uh, audience. Thanks for spending this time with us today. And uh, we pray for the Lord's blessing and guidance as you continue to stimulate these ideas and uh, share particularly in the strategic nature of this ministry. Thank you for being with us today. Thank you. Thanks for having me. As we wrap up today, let's also be reminded to pray for Christian businessmen and women who are seeking to have a redemptive influence through their business or profession. Let's continue to erode the unnecessary barrier that we talked about between the sacred and the secular. We don't want to forget or diminish how the Lord uses all kinds of talents and abilities to take the good news to those who have never heard. 
Last year, we had another episode along these lines. It was number 109 with Dale Losh from Crossworld, Making Disciples Through Our Vocations. If you're interested in this topic, you might want to go back and check out that episode. This episode is brought to you by the Global Missions Toolbox and produced by Send International in collaboration with other like-minded agencies. We'll be back again in two weeks with another episode, and we'll continue to explore this grand adventure of being Christ's witnesses to the ends of the earth.